that we were just looking at. Um, there's a series of chain actors linked together by flows of products, finance information, and services. So when we look at those those commodities, each one of them has a has a supply chain. So we end up seeing that uh, each commodity has a an upstream, a mid midstream, and a downstream part to the supply chain. Being this uh, land preparation, production, harvesting, the it then continues with processing, storage, packaging, uh, going down to the the sales and consumers where each and every one of, of us end, ends up buying one of these products. So if we take a close look at one commodity in particular like palm oil, we can see that there's water, agrochemicals, agriculture, production, harvesting, raw materials, uh, and then there's a secondary process until it continues until it until its consumption. Uh, my idea of showing this this slide is that uh, going back to the previous one, we can see that the impact on biodiversity or or on the ecosystems is higher in the upstream part, where uh, where commodities are being produced and harvested. Uh, the impact on the ecosystem and ecosystems or biodiversity is less as we go up the up the supply chain. J just to give you an idea, I know this this slide is a bit too complicated, and you might not even. Benicio, I'm sorry. To, Benicio, sorry to interrupt. I'm getting a lot of messaging that some folks can't actually see the presentation. I'm guessing because of internet connection. Is there any way that you could take a second and just email me a copy of it, and then I'll email it to everyone in the presentation that's attending the webinar? I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're doing an excellent job. Oh my God. Okay. Is that too complicated? No. Okay. So for everyone on the line, thanks for your patience. I understand that some of you can't see the webinar, so I'm going to send it out to the entire attendance list in within the next couple of minutes, and then that will allow you to access it via email. So just give me a little time for that. Um, but in the meantime, continue to listen in with Vinicio, and you're doing an excellent job, and I'll turn it back over to you. Did you get a link on Skype? Thank you. Okay, should I continue? Please, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, no problem. So as I was telling you, let's go back for a second. Um, commodities and supply chain, uh, the impact of uh, commodities is higher in production, the upstream part where production, crop, uh, land preparation and harvesting take place. The higher it goes in the supply chain, the less is the apparent impact on on ecosystems and biodiversity. I was showing you an example of uh, palm oil. Uh, the white part is what is defined as uh, the, the links in the supply chain that are affecting more biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, I, you might not be able to read uh, the inner, the inside of the each of the supply chains here, but um, my idea here is just to show you that uh, the impact of by the impact of commodities on biodiversity takes place in the initial part uh, where production takes place and harvesting takes place. Uh, as it goes up in the supply chain, the the impact on biodiversity is less. Uh, I'm not saying it's it's not happening. I'm just saying it's less. So this would be the part on, on commodities, and then we would go into what is sustainability. So sustainability is this comes from the UN definition. Um, sustainability implies the use of resources at rates that do not exceed the capacity of nature to replace them. Uh, this is the simplest definition I could get. Uh, in other words, this could, me this could mean 
Um, water is consumed in water basins at rates that can be replenished by inflows and rainfall. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions are balanced by carbon fixation and storage. Soil degradation and biodiversity loss are halted. Pollutants do not accumulate in the environment. Fisheries and other renewable resources are not depleted beyond their capacity to recover. Uh, sustainability also extends to, to the financial to the hum and human capital, food production, economic growth, economic growth that must be created sufficient well to maintain a viable and healthy workforce. workforce. Um, skills must be transmitted to future generations of producers. So basically sustainability as a definition says that there it's the use of resources at rates that do not exceed the capacity of nature to replace them. So what is what is sustainability in the supply chain? Um, in the supply chain, sustainability would refer to the management of environmental, social, and economic impacts and the encouragement of good governance practices through the life cycle of goods and services. Um, and how would this basically in the agro commodity production, which is what we are dealing with here, it's, it's basically the same. It's just taking into account that there are social and environmental aspects that have to be taken into account. Uh, and in this case, where uh, producers uh, play, a mo play the, one of the most important roles of the, of the supply chain. So with this, now we have a definition of sustainability. How, how do we move on to sustainability? How do we transition to sustainability? Uh, the sector transformation uh, website, which I will discuss it later, uh, pr presents a, a framework where you can actually understand how, how a sector or a commodity or, or a specific uh, agriculture product could or or market could move on in sustainability. Uh, if you look at this uh, this framework, it starts with, with instruments. In this case, the instruments are usually voluntary sustainability standards, um, industry-based standards, company companies' codes of conduct, benchmarking, uh, other standards and uh, to avoid multiple certification, which are usually companies based, use of data management, data sharing systems, life cycle analysis, supply chain analysis, and there's many other more uh, quantitative impact assessment tools that, that you could use to, to in, in this case, as instruments, including RED and payment for environmental services. Uh, these instruments. Uh, impact of forces within a sector. So what are these forces that, that I'm, I'm presenting here or, or the framework is presenting? Uh, there's a series of forces uh, that shape the agricultural sector within a specific country. These forces can be categorized into four areas or domain which include production characteristics of the, of the specific uh, country market characteristics, enabling environment, and alternative livelihoods. These are all forces that uh, play different, uh, that are different in, in every case, in every scenario, that end up uh, affecting a sector, the shape of a sector. If we look here, there's, a, there's different sector shapes. Uh, the, the model presents four different sector shapes referring to a flat pyramid where uh, where there's a large majority of farmers at the bottom of the pyramid with a very low level of formal organizations. Um, the shape two, which is also a pyramid shape, but it's uh, less flat than the first one, means that the level of organization is slightly higher in the sector and more farmers are organized in produce organizations or larger scale farmers. Uh, there's usually one uh, or a few couple bigger uh, state farmers than, than, than smaller ones. 
the the sec the, the shape number three is a, like a pentagon type where most farmers have higher level of organization. Uh, they still do not own large single farm estates, but they are more organized and have similar uh, small uh, similar small holders and large large estates. Uh, in this type of sector, farms do not have to grow in size; they just become more efficient and 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 work together. Uh, the last four, the last uh, shape, which is like an inverted triangle, it's basically where most of the production is done by big farmers or real estate, and there is a very few amount of small farmers. Um, the the relationship between the instruments, forces, and shapes uh, end up affecting the the S curve in this case, which if Refer, the S curve basically refers to the inception part of uh, of sustainability, where awareness is promoted. There's uh, no approach to sustainability or stakeholder action yet. Uh, the market demand for a sustainable product is very niche and premium, uh, and, and premiums are paid. Uh, the second phase is where first movers happen. People start. Uh, the market demand for sustainable products increases, so slowly people are starting getting in involved. There is, in, there is an increase in sustainability initiatives, standards and certification models start growing. So the first movers here is capitalized on, le on, on leadership to dif differentiate from competition. The third phase is where there is a critical mass. Uh, sustainable practices might reach up to 20 to 30 percent sustainability moves beyond certification as the scope as the scope broadens. There's inclusivity becomes a key driver with significant smallholder uh, market shares. So linking to sustainability to, to a business case for sustainable practices is critical here. Uh, Public-private uh, partnerships are taking place, and the last uh, phase here is institutionalization. This is basically the ideal situation where illegal practices are over, sustainability is main, uh, market demand and government coordinate agendas uh, and instruments, any kind of instrument involved uh, are complementary and effective to realize systematic change. So uh, this transition to sustainability framework, uh, there is a document about it. The, uh, the team that created this uh, framework uh, uh, has made it available. It's online. Uh, you can read more about it and understand uh, each and every one of the the components that uh, help a sector move from uh, basically transition to sustainability, right? So later, I, I didn't. I just mentioned uh, sustainability standards in the previous one, which was one of the instruments. Uh, I think it's important to to mention this because uh, there is a vast number of sustainability standards and initiatives. Uh, just Echo Label has 459, and ITC has 175 uh, voluntary sustainability standards um, for the. Ten commodities that I previously mentioned. These are the major, the major um, sustainability standards that are that are in use. Uh, most of the most, well, I think, almost all of the eco labels or, or voluntary sustainability standards either cover one, one or two of a business, uh, two basic business models. Uh, the first one is where consumer is consumer facing labels where inform consumers about production practices they are linked with education and brand development promote intentional sustainable consumption and the other one is the business to business initiatives where uh, private sector demand uh, certification there's more uh, usually integrated within a labeling system but most of the almost each of the each of the sustainability standards fall under one of of the business models either business to business or 
consumer facing labels. So it's either business pushing businesses or uh, the consumer are demanding more sustainable products. Uh, the main components of the sustainability standards, which are usually related to to the value proposition of the of the sustainability standards or their benefits, uh, are, are what you can see here. Uh, sustainability standards uh, they started as multi-stakeholder instruments to link market demand for sustainability with, with a supply of sustainability produced commodities. Uh, they have been, they have proved to be instrumental in providing a platform for dialogue and governance with the scheme management and governance here, defining and operationalizing sustainability with the principles, uh, support or, incent or incentive for implementation, which is the implementation support, providing assurance, verification mechanisms and accreditation, providing transparency with a chain of custody requirements and traceability system, and providing market and brand value, which is the scheme marketing and communication. Uh, but in, in most of the cases, uh, voluntary sustainability standards are seen as the, as the core of, the, of what sustainability represents. Uh, so far, they have been, they have been useful in, in achieving sustainability for much, for much of the commodities, but they also have some issues and some challenges uh, in, related to lack of demand. Uh, it's very difficult for them to, difficult and costly to reach uh, supply. Um, the implementation of the best practice is unsustainable for, for most of, for, for the model. Uh, in most cases, the producers don't have the money to pay all these uh, certification schemes. Uh, they have a limited impact in uh, assessments and, and mixed impact results, so it's not always what the impact is not always what they expect. The assurance issues with the quality of audits. Uh, every mechan every certification scheme have their own auditors, and it, there is a huge uh, number of uh, of mechanisms on, on different ways how it's uh, issues with credibility and at the end with added value of the of what a sustainability standard would represent. So after looking at what is commodity supply chain and sustainability, what is sustainable commodity supply chain? Uh, it was very difficult. I think I couldn't find a, a uh, published uh, def uh, very well defined meaning for what sustainable commodity supply chain uh, represents. But in the case of what I've, I've shown to you in the previous slides, I was able to come up with a, uh, a definition which is basically a mixture, uh, a combination of, of the meanings of, uh, of the three, pre three previous uh, uh, definitions that we have seen of the components. Uh, the term sustainable commodity supply chain, you can state it as the production, processing, and commercialization of goods and services. All this under the good governance practices and management of environmental, social, and economic impacts. As I said before, without exceeding the capacity of nature to replace them. Uh, at the end, the objective of sustainability in the commodity supply chain is to create, protect, and grow long-term environmental, social, and economic value for all stakeholders that are involved in bringing products and service to the market. Um, so, so why is sustainable commodity supply chain so, so important for, for the work that we're doing or for, for commodities in this sense? Um, uh, literature, experiences, projects, and everything else I could find uh, states that the adoption of this this terminology or this sustainable commodity supply chain as an approach would allow companies, farmers, and many other stakeholders to ensure compliance with laws and regulations, uh, to meet customer requirements, differentiate themselves, and to in and also support international principles for sustainable business conduct. 
So in, in other words, we can use sustainable commodity supply chain to, to reduce the impact on biodiversity that is being caused by the production of commodities. Um, in this case, companies, farmers, and other stakeholders take actions to result uh, increasingly that take actions that result in better social, economic, and environmental impact. This is not only this is happens not only because society expects this, but because there are many bis many businesses benefits to it uh, by managing and seeking to improve environmental, social, and economic performance and good governance throughout supply chain, companies act in their own interest in most of the cases, but the interests of their stakeholders and, and, and also the interests of society at large. So many companies take into account or many stakeholders that take into account sustainable commodity supply chain because it represents a benefit for, for in this case, most of the actors. right? and to society in general. Okay, this is what sustainable commodity supply chain is. So how do we implement it now? Um, to be honest, I couldn't find a recipe for it. Uh, I, I was able to analyze uh, or, or do research with as many projects and report, reports and different academic uh, documents or papers and there's no recipe for it. Um, I was able to locate two doc, um, two articles by the same author, by the same three authors, where they are not providing a recipe for, for how to implement sustainable commodity supply chain, but they're providing a framework where you can actually analyze uh, uh, how a sustainable commodity supply chain is being implemented and and in this case be able to to replicate. Uh, the documents are online. Um, I'm just presenting here the I, I guess everyone can can look for them. Uh, the framework consists in uh, well, well the idea that agriculture commodity production is directly tied to market demand and supply trends. Uh, if you implement and enforce interventions that in one way or the other influence one or more of the actors or linkages within the supply chain, you might be able to have the potential to influence the production of agricultural commodities. So in this case the framework is being used to understand interventions. Uh, when I say interventions, I will discuss it in the next slide. Uh, the use of interventions and their impacts on the commodity supply chains, the group of supply chain actors, and the combination of mechanisms upon, upon which they depend. So you are basically analyzing how actors use interventions to influence behaviors and supply chains. Uh, the framework was developed to guide the analysis of chain interventions. The framework compares and explains the impacts of interventions used by different actors, so it's just what I said. Um, it describes the range of, of a commodity agriculture interventions being developed and implemented in the forest agriculture landscape. So it, in this case, the, the article is using three commodities, which are soy, uh, beef, and uh, sugar, if I'm not mistaken. So it, based on, on these three commodities, they're able to come up with this framework um, and be able to outline the governance mechanisms associated with the different type of interventions that take place. They also discuss how different actors and interventions can be expected to influence the impact of commodity agriculture production. But overall, the framework can be used to characterize different interventions using a common language and structure to aid planning and, anal and analysis of interventions and to facilitate the evaluation of interventions with respect to their structure and outcomes. Uh, I was able to take, uh, well here, I'm, uh, I was able to analyze at least eight, eight to ten ongoing sustainable commodity supply chain processes and uh, most of these uh, 
in one way or the other adapt or fit under this framework where you have actors, either state market or civil society, using interventions to influence uh, behaviors in the supply chain, uh, being producers, processors, distributors, and consumers to have different impacts on the either economic, environmental, or social. Uh, there's no recipe, there's no standard version of how to do this, but um, most of the projects uh, fall under this, under this framework. So interventions are, I know interventions could, each project uses so many different interventions, but for instance, capacity building, capacity building could fit so many, so many other types of interventions, uh, uh, targeting different consumers, different producers, different uh, uh, parts, different linkages of the supply chain. But usually, uh, most of the interventions are are implemented by the actors, and they either belong to inst institution and policies, information and technology, and incentives. In one way or the other, uh, most of the Interventions are, are linked to this type of uh, intervention, or these names. So when we look at the framework, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to, to, to read this, to see this, but uh, the role of the actors influencing agricultural commodity here um, depend on their position and influence within the supply chain. Uh, interventions may directly target individual producers or different market sectors. So we have uh, market actors. Uh, in this case, market actors are considered a supply chain. They have different uh, flows among them, either money, information, services, products. And on the other hand, we have uh, uh, the peri peripheral actors, which is the state, different communities, uh, civil society, uh, end up using different uh, different interven uh, interventions uh, in one way or the other, either institution incentives or related to information and technology, and in one way or the other, end up affecting the the supply chain. You can see in this framework uh, a direct uh, link to which actor is using which uh, intervention to affect. Uh, which linkage, linkage in the supply chain. Most of the examples that I've, or the projects that I've managed to analyze and, and, uh, and study for this uh, webinar fall under this. So this might not be a recipe, but it's a very good, uh, it's a very good case or a very good example of how you would be able to take any project and uh, analyze it uh, through this framework. Um, let's take a look at a couple examples. Uh, the Green Commodities Program has a mission to transform agricultural and trade production uh, through multi-stakeholder collaboration and the establishment of effective national enabling environments. This is the UNDP Green Commodities Program. They have a holistic approach. At the global level, uh, the, the Green Commodity Program is the center of expertise and knowledge management. Uh, they facilitate the sharing of country experiences and lessons on modalities of to, to generate uh, public-private partnerships. These public-private partnerships uh, have the objective of strengthening uh, and creating a better enabling environment. Uh, access a link between the global forums and standards and, na and national activities. At the country level, uh, it creates national commodity platforms and provides uh, policy advice, institutional capacity building, and finance for producers. Uh, this is the you can reach and learn more about the Green Commodities Program in the link uh, presented. Uh, there's plenty of information related to how they're working and the different activities they're implementing in in particular countries. The Global Environmental Facility has a, another project named uh, Taking Deforestation Out of Commodity Supply Chain. 
they pretend to read or they, sorry for the word their their objective is to reduce the global impact of agriculture commodities on climate change and biodiversity by meeting the growing supply and demand of palm oil soy and beef to means that only the deforestation uh, they're trying to to reduce deforestation in the com in the use of these commodities uh, it's a four year coordinated supply chain program uh, the program is investing in, in specific stages of key commodity supply chains in, in regions already identified that have an expansion, a rapid expansion of key commodities that just mentioned. Uh, interventions will be prioritized using criteria such as their potential to generate significant global environmental benefits, threat and opportunity profile among others. Uh, sorry, this is uh, basically the, the, the project, uh, the program. They're going to be implementing projects under four different components, which is adaptive management, uh, support to production has uh, different interventions, increase of demand, and enabling transactions. All these under targeted landscapes, markets, and commodities. Uh, in the web, in the e-learning course that the, the NVSAP forum is going to be presenting in the coming months, I also analyzed the these other examples, which I think are a very good, uh, it's a very good range of projects and programs or, or initiatives that, where you can see how uh, international organizations, NGOs, uh, regional projects are implementing, are using interventions to to affect the supply chain, the commodity supply chain. Uh, some recommendations uh, I couldn't find. Uh, a recipe as well for, for recommendations on how to how to implement sustainable commodity supply chain but some of the recommendations I found were uh, I'm going to present you with three ideas here uh, I think there's I found like five or six but I'm, I took the three most important and uh, important and I'm presenting them here the global initiative on commodity was an uh, international partnership and they presented this document with ideas of how to uh, uh, how to carry on uh, sustainable development and include uh, commodities in the process. They state that you should, uh, in the document you can find this uh, different steps uh, better explained. You usually begin with an assessment, ensure the participatory governance, uh, you have to choose your members, develop national commodity strategies, facilitate the strengthening of local producer organizations, uh, fortify international commodity bodies, improve access to information, create institutional framework, promote access to high value market, and stimulate producer access to finance. Uh, another one was the sustainable sector transformation. You, this is their website. You can access. They have plenty of information related to to how a sector could be brought to be more sustainable. Uh, the sustainable sector transformation model consists of five major building blocks that are, uh, are conditions of change. Uh, this model can be used to guide sustainable transformation of a sector uh, under two major principles. Uh, the first principle establishes that transformation only occurs if the incentive in the market encourages continuous improvement. And the second principle states that there is sufficient value retention at the production base to reinvest in the sector with limited external assistance. Um, you can look, you can see the, the different components here, uh, sector alignment and accountability. These are better explained in the document if you can access the, the website and, and download their documents. Uh, strengthening of demand, public sector governance, organization of the production base, and organization of the service sector. The combination of these different uh, uh, components, uh, according to them, is a good alternative on how to make a sector, a commodity sector, a market sector, move on towards uh, a more sustainable um, production base. Okay, the other one is uh, the Katumba 9 scaling up sustainable supply chain gathering provided also uh, presented a document with three approaches on how to carry on sustainable commodity supply chain. 
referring to territorial approach, uh, integrated public-private financing, and a bottom-up approach to global sustainable supply chain. You can access this uh, this document at the link uh, here presented. Due to time, I'm not going to discuss more. So the Convention on Biological Diversity, just to to make it quick, because I'm over 40 minutes already. Uh, the CBD through the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity and the H Biodiversity tar Target has the mission of taking effective and urgent action to halt the loss of biodiversity in order to ensure ecosystems uh, are resilient and continue to provide essential services. So here, sustainable commodity supply chain plays an important role in helping to achieve uh, a couple of the H Biodiversity Targets. Uh, these are 20. My idea is not for you to read this, it's just to show you that there are 20 targets and sustainable commodity supply chain plays an important role for number four, which refers to sustainable consumption and production, and sustainable and also number seven, which refers to sustainable agriculture, aquaculture, and forestry. And uh, in this case, since we're dealing with the, the NBSAPs, uh, it's important for MBSAPs to, add, to consider taking into account sustainable commodity supply chain as an approach to assist them in the implementation of the, the, CB, the convention on, on oh, the CBD. Sorry, I forgot the, what BND represented. So NBSAPs, uh, National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans, we just saw that it's one of the targets. Uh, so what are NBSAPs? Uh, the NBSAP in this case is the principal instrument for implementing the, the CBD at the national level. Uh, Article 6 of the, the CBD and the targets and target 17 requires the countries to prepare and ensure that this uh, the NBSAP is mainstream into the planning and activities of all those sectors whose activities can have an impact on biodiversity. Um, NBSAPs are to, be are to be developed through participatory approach and are to be used as effective tools uh, to protect the environment or biodiversity in this case. Uh, so how do we develop an NBSAP? Uh, simple steps would be to get organized, to engage stakeholders, gather information, develop strategies, develop plans for implementation, implement the NBSAP, and monitor and report. These general activities can be better uh, analyzed, or can be better studied at the NBSAP journey developed by the NBSAP forum. Uh, this is a general, this is the link, and uh, this is how we will look uh, logging when you log in. This provides with a general idea of the different steps necessary for the development of the NBSAP. Uh, if you click in each one of the of the steps, you will have an interactive version that provides you with more more information related to every step of the process, uh, which is something like this. This is just to show you what, what it represents. And you can access this through the NBSAP forum. Um, the NBSAP forum here is also provides a lot of information and support for the development of the NBSAP such as this webinar and the e-learning courses that are coming up. So what is the relationship between sustainable commodity supply chains and, uh, and the NBSAPs? Uh, the NBSAP is the instrument through which the CBD should be implemented at the local level. We just, we just saw that. Uh, the use of sustainable commodity supply chain can contribute to the reduction of biodiversity loss. We just saw that. So it is relevant for parties to consider the inclusion of sustainable commodity supply chain in the development of their NBSAP. We, this is what we're going to be discussing at the end of this uh, presentation. And uh, how should we do this? Uh, mainstreaming. Uh, a simple definition of mainstreaming is integrating biodiversity goals into sector plans and policies using a variety of methods and approaches. Uh, mainstreaming wait. mainstreaming is, is usually used as a verb uh, to mainstream. Uh, has also has been applied to a wide range of domains. Uh, 
a simple dictionary definition would be to cause someone or something to be included or accepted by a group that includes most people. Uh, the term mainstreaming is most often used alone or with other words. Uh, recently, it has been used with environment, uh, with conservation, with biodiversity. Uh, however, in those circles where the term biodiversity mainstreaming is commonly used, it's, it's usually shortened to just mainstreaming. So mainstreaming in this case refers to biodiversity mainstreaming, uh, which at the end biodiversity mainstreaming refers to focusing on enabling environment at uh, at local, national, or global levels. Uh, it can also focus on development policy, legislation, land use planning, finance, taxation, economic incentives, international trade, capacity building, research and technology. Um, it can also focus on commodity chains, supply chains, and certification of major natural resources. Uh, mainstreaming can be pursued by a wide range of actors, from conservation NGOs to industry, stakeholder, different stakeholders, government, or even communities in, in most of the cases. Um, uh, there have been two expert gatherings, uh, two workshops, uh, led by the Global Environmental Facility in South Africa in 2004 and 2013. Uh, both of them presented a great, uh, resulted in a document where, <clears throat> well, this is the definition that was def defining, <clears throat> sorry. Sorry, <clears throat> drinking some water. <clears throat> so mainstreaming in this case uh, is defined as the means to internalize the goals of biodiversity conservation and the sustainable use of biological resources into economic sectors and development models, policies, and programs. Uh, by 2014, the definition was was almost uh, almost the same. In, in this case, uh, in adding policies, strategies, and, and practices of key public and private actors. Right? Uh, it's it's basically the same. It's just referring more, taking more into account uh, uh, more social aspects. Um, this the last one of the last uh, gatherings also presented uh, generated a document named the ten, ten steps to biodiversity mainstreaming. Uh, you can download this document from the link uh, presented. Uh, the ten steps would simply be as uh, the first five would be assess the the different problems, identify the elements of biodiversity to be mainstream, uh, identify the sectors and development goals, uh, the desired biodiversity and development outcomes, uh, shape a, com a communication strategy, identify and engage stakeholders, enabling factors for mainstreaming, identify approaches, uh, and present it as a business case to persuade stakeholders, and uh, monitoring and evaluation. So. These are the, the, the steps that, uh, that this guide is suggesting. Uh, I, I found a lot of cases on how this could be implemented. So, but due to time uh, constraints, I'm not able to present them here. So at the end, I'm giving you three documents, uh, presenting three documents that where you can actually take, in, take into consideration as many cases as you want. Uh, but for, for the meantime, uh, how would this look like? How does mainstreaming would look like? Uh, mainstreaming should integrate conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity across sectors, sector plans. For instance, sustainable development, poverty reduction, climate change adaptation and mitigation, trade, international cooperation. And in sector specific uh, plans, such as agriculture, fisheries, forestry, uh, mining, energy, tourism, transport, and others. So a country's mainstream efforts uh, should be a central component of national biodiversity strategy and action plan. So NVSATs need to take into consideration that mainstreaming is is key for the 
for the implementation. Um, so those 10 steps is, is basically the way uh, biodiversity could be mainstream and it's exactly the same way sustainable commodity supply chain could be mainstream. Uh, so the way this could be implement, uh, integrated into the different sectors or cross-sectoral is through policy documents, plans and actions, budgets, legislation, indicators. This is, is almost like interventions as we discussed in the previous uh, uh, framework. Uh, how do how how this this are I'm presenting you here with three different uh, how how can mainstreaming of biodiversity into sectors can include the different strategies and three different strategies here that I'm going to present has to do with uh, the reduction of negative to enhance positive impacts that sector has on biodiversity uh, for instance in agriculture you can minimize the use or optimize the application of chemical fertilizers and pesticides to reduce negative impacts on groundwater or, or surrounding habitats or wildlife that could be an example uh, enhance or to restore biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, an example from the top of my head here would be uh, not take zones in marine areas, in drylands, or in forests, or other productive uh, ecosystems. Um, the third one is secure and promote local communities' access to benefits from the use of biodiversity. These are uh, three, strat uh, three strategies that are easy to, to understand, but in any case, you really, really want to look into how does mainstreaming would look like in, in other cases we have these three documents they have enough or information on how to present this different uh, how do mainstreaming look like and uh, either for just biodiverse, biodiversity or in the case of sustainable commodity supply chain or for uh, sustainable development as well um, so this would be on my behalf and if there's any questions we will or there's a discussion that we can take uh, uh, on, you would be here now. Christian? Great. Are there any questions? Yeah. Are there any questions for Vinicio? No questions at all. Oh, Eric, is this Ross? Let's see, chat. Diego, do you want to read the question out loud? Hold on, I'm having a bit of a technology issue. Um, let me pull up the dashboard and I think I can unmute folks with questions. Aras, are you unmuted? It looks like you are. Are you able to ask your question or am I the only one who can't hear it? Well, I posted a question at the start of the thing, so that was not about the presentation. It was all about when does it start. Okay. Thank you. Diego, it looked like you had. Hi everybody. No, I am just uh, saying that it, there is a non-answered question about uh, what is the source of sustainability definition. Uh, this definition only encompasses one pillar of sustainability, the ecological sustainability. What about the social sustainability? This is a question from, let me one second, from Viola Bellohart. Yes, and she's totally right. I I was focusing, as I said, on the the ecological part here, or the uh, I I the social and the economic part. I just mentioned it. I didn't because I was looking for a definition simple enough to to encompass uh, the biodiversity part of. Uh, the economic and the social part, I just mentioned it. I didn't wrote it there as a 
otherwise it would be too long and I, it's it's the UN version is this report I don't have the report in mind right now uh, but it's the uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that I don't have the, the the source in mind right now but it's 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 the UN version the UN report I Okay, thank you very much. If you find it, we can set it out with the notes. I'm seeing another question from Pasqual. Pasqual. It says, have you looked at the other Jeff integrated approach pilot on sustainable and resilient food systems? The focus is on food security and stable food, but I think it is very relevant here. I haven't, to be honest. I didn't. But I will look into it. Okay, we have another question from Chakik Nemawoi. Could we consider uh, SCSC an introduction to ABC, the Nagoya Protocol? Can we consider sustainable yeah. commodity supply chain as a beginning for the ABC? Uh, is Jamie Jamie I need I think I need your help here I to be honest I'm not I don't consider myself capable of answering that question so um, can you repeat the question uh, Vinicio the question, uh, this is Diego, yeah, the question is, uh, could we consider the sustainable chain plan an introduction to ABS, the Nagoya Protocol? They're such completely different issues. They intersect uh, at the sourcing uh, node where products are sourced and supplied, but it's, I suppose you could say it's a component of ABS, it's a small component. But ABS has more to do with access and benefit sharing and rights and prior informed consent. Sustainable co production is one small component of it. I suppose you could conceive of it as uh, the, the very first stage of an ABS um, process. Thank you, Jamie. We have another question from Luis. Antonio that says may we go to the definition you want me to go to the definition there we go um, the question is coming from Luis Antonio and he says may we go to the definition the supply chain is sustainable if the project can be offered by nature I thought it was sustainable if we offer the product reducing consumption or having an efficient production process. And I think for the purposes of this, this discussion period, I'm going to unmute, I'm going to try unmuting everyone um, so we can have a better discussion than us moving back and forth. But to do so, I'm going to need everyone that isn't speaking to put their microphones on mute. And if it doesn't work, I'll just take back the control. So if everyone could put themselves on mute, I'll unmute the um, software now. And then, Luis, you could actually ask a question yourself. I'm not sure that's this. this thing. You are able to unmute everyone else. Oh, hola, buenos dias. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, may we go to definition, please, to the slide? You need a definition yeah. or tomorrow. 
Okay, so now I think this is going to work because I can actually hear everyone. So Silenciado. Okay, I've muted everyone. Sorry, there was too much background noise. Luis, I will. Sonido reactivado. Okay, Vinicio, over to you. Thank you. Uh, the definition says that uh, at the end, <coughs> without exceeding the capacity of nature to replace them, is that uh, the chain is sustainable if we can uh, have some goods, products, some goods and services, and nature after that can replace them? I don't get it, actually. I'm basically combining two definitions here to to try to come up with a with a let's say a acceptable definition of what sustainable commodity supply chain would would represent. And if you take the whatever is in Dash, which says under good governance practices and management of environmental, social, and economic impacts, uh, the definition would be what sustainability is, right? Of course, referring to the environmental part and not including social and economic part here, which is the, the production, processing, and commercializations of goods and services without exceeding capacity of nature to replace them, right? So I, I'm just adding the, the good governance practices and management uh, of environmental, social, and economic impacts to to include, uh, to try to come up with a, a, an acceptable definition of what sustainable commodity supply chain would, would mean, as there is no uh, definition, I couldn't find a, a standard definition of, of it. Okay. Would, would that answer your question? Thank you. Luis, did that answer your question? Luis? Yes, okay. Christina, okay. Uh, I can hear you. Did that answer your question? Uh, no, no, it, it didn't, but uh, yes, it's not, we don't have any standard definition, so we can have a discussion later in the email. Okay. So then I'm going to mute you again <laughs> and unmute Elena who has a question about sustainable co commodity supply chains. What are the tools to motivate stakeholders to build the sustainable chains? And you're unmuted. I'm unmuted. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, in real. Excuse me. Do you hear me? Yes. I, I don't understand if you you hear me. Okay. I see that probably you hear me. So I'm interested uh, how to make uh, real the good government practices and management uh, in the development of sustainable. Com uh, commodity supply chain in the practices, for example, of developing states. Because as I know, uh, they do not follow often uh, to the good gov governance practices. Excuse me, I don't understand if you hear it me. We can hear you great. Okay, thank you. So what are, your question is basically, what are the tools to motivate? Uh, yes. Um, to, to, uh, to motivate, for example, producers to, to use, uh, to build the sustainable co commodity supply chains. 
you, you have to take into account that sustainable commodity supply chain here refers to to different uh, to different links. Uh, and uh, if we look at the framework uh, that we were discussing here, uh, there's a there's an interaction that takes place between actors in the in the supply chain and uh, external actors and uh, these external actors include uh, many stakeholders including NGOs, governments, uh, civil society uh, and uh, they use all the different interventions that, that they could take uh, that they could come up with uh, either incentives either either under part of the institution and policies and uh, either information and, and technology. There's a set of uh, interventions that they can use in one way or the other and in, in influence the behavior and, uh, and the different activities that each actor in the supply chain could, could be working with and be able to influence. Um, how to do this? Uh, there's, I don't think there's a, a standard way of doing it. Uh, each project tries to do it in a different way. Each program tries to do it in, a, in what they consider their own uh, their own perfect way, according to the scenario that they're that they're being presented with, according to the context. So if what you are looking for is a is a standard version, a standard way of how to do this. Uh, I cannot give you that standard way. What I can give you is that there is a a relation uh, relationship between the different actors outside the supply chain using interventions, interventions related to incentives, information and technology, institution and policies that in one way or the other could affect the behavior of these different uh, linkages in the supply chain, being producers, processors, distributors, and consumers. I think it should be market uh, tools uh, to motivate, motivate consumers and producers to use uh, such uh, chains in the practices. Yeah, uh, mar market thank you for your Thank you for answer. Okay. Yeah, market market tools is one of it. It could be it could be different tools depending or different uh, interventions depending on the scenario that you're dealing with and whoever you're you're working with. Yes, I agree. I agree because social uh, social also has very big uh, impact and motivation what to do for the producers. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. You're welcome. Great. Okay, next question is coming from Trevor. How do companies like Monsanto, Square With, or apply mainstreaming for biodiversity? Do they? If not, how can that change? And I'm going to work to unmute Trevor. No. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I'm unmuting Trevor. And the question is, how do companies like Man Monsanto, Square with or apply mainstreaming for biodiversity, do they? If not, how can that change? And Trevor, you should be unmuted if you wanted to expand on that question. And then um, if anyone else has a question, feel free to type it in and we'll get it answered. And I don't Trevor, know if you over can to you. Hear. Can you hear me? I'm yes. not sure I you can? Yes. I can oh, hear good. you great. I can hear you great. great. I like the framework, and it's uh, certainly be robust enough. What concerns me is how all the big players that have so many other incentives and motivations to change and shift their whole agenda and strategies to to adopt this. And I'm thinking of big players like Monsanto, other major food corporation chains, whatever the supply is. So it troubles. I guess my question is, to what extent can we be optimistic that this approach and framework can actually be adopted and applied? 
well, the framework is the framework here presented, or the way the framework is designed, is is it's, it's not being designed like the way adapted or the way fitted to the big players or or, or the which kind of uh, linkage in the supply chain do we do we adapt this uh, this framework. The framework is actually being used, being presented to to be able to analyze how these uh, players work. Uh, let's say if if Monsanto or any other big uh, uh, player here do, doesn't fit into into this, why does it doesn't fit? Why what what are the reasons that it doesn't fit? So which external actors or peripheral actors are not involved here or are not working? What uh, and then you look at the types of interventions that we should be using to be able to target those uh, those kind of players. So I think the question is is or or the what we have to have in mind is not that can we adapt uh, the framework to those uh, players, but uh, we can use the framework to analyze why are the players not being what are those? Why are those big players not being able to to fit under this? Is it because uh, they're too big that we can just not control them, or they have enough power to lobby against whatever intervention, whosoever other actor could use against them to be able to control them? Do, does that answer your question? Do, do I? I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking do, about it. Do I make you think? <laughs> Good. Well, I'm thinking. Of, I'm thinking. In the front, I mean, trying to get large players to buy into sustainable development is extremely difficult, and I don't know how that changes. I mean, I've seen so much in other levels of government and elsewhere trying to affect a change to, as it is to say, save the planet. And um, I think I see your framework possibility is just a way of changing the whole approach of thinking that I'm hoping for. So I'll have to think about some more how you come at this. Yeah. In, in, in my personal idea or my personal thought, I think that the, the different interventions that could be used under this framework uh, could be applied to those kind of players, and if uh, the 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 issue to discuss here it would be if those players want to abide by those different interventions that they that they that are being applied yeah. in, to them. Yeah, the question right? is how the question is how do you go about doing that? I don't have the answer, <laughs> but it's it's I can see a lot of like there's a lot of good thought in academics. In, in the discussion that I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, I'm just trying to figure out how to affect a, a good approach for this stuff in, in the real world. And uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just, uh, uh, I don't have the answer. Still thinking it through. <laughs> I, oh, excellent I, question, Trevor. Yes, thank, thank, you. thank you for your question. Okay, next question is coming from Viola. and. Um, Unmuting you. Can you? And the question is, I'll read it out loud, and then if there's any add-on that could happen. Um, she's saying that her internet connection is great, but she'd like to make a follow-up comment to the question on the definition of the sustainable commodity supply chain. She's preferring if I could read the question. Target IT biodiversity target for calls for sustainable production and consumption. We cannot have sustainable production and consumption if we do not look at the social element. Are standards and norms fair and equitable and respect and do they respect human rights? For instance, looking at the new deforestation looking at the new deforestation commitments of companies, do they accommodate the rights and livelihoods of local communities and IPs? Viola, did you have anything else to add to that? Um Yes, I wanted to write a uh, new CO deforestation commitment, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So it sounds like the question 
it is almost posed for discussion um, how are we considering that, fair, that if standards are fair and equitable um, and if they respect human rights. Benicio, could you talk about how that can be incorporated into this approach? Can you please repeat the question? Uh, I, I think I got half of what you were saying, just the question. Yep, the question is, we cannot have sustainable production and consumption if we do not look at the social elements of fair and equitable standards and respects of human rights. How could you incorporate, how could you use this approach to incorporate those elements? For instance, looking at new deforestation commitments of companies, do they accommodate the rights and livelihoods of local communities and IPs? It's a very long question. Yes. Oh. So should I explain the question again? Uh, maybe I didn't uh, raise it very clearly. So it's just about, are we talking about the ecological sustainability of um, supply chains? And so how does this relate to human rights and uh, livelihoods of uh, local communities? How do we make sure that they're not being undermined? Uh. I'm considering, when I say sustainable, when you look at the definition that I have in front of me, uh, I am including environmental, social, and economic impacts here. Uh, I'm considering the social aspects and the economic aspects of this, this case. When I define sustainability before, yeah, I might have just mentioned the economic, the social, the environmental part, and I just mentioned the social and economic part. So. I'm actually considering that sustainable a commodity supply chain will take into account the three the three pillars of, of sustainability. What would, in instance, reforest, uh, forestry companies will do to take into account that? I think it has to do independently or or for a, for particular cases. Um, that falling under or looking at the framework, I would say that the different interventions could adapt to it. Um, uh, just to look at its certification, we take into account uh, most of the certification schemes take into account social and economic aspects too, apart from the environmental uh, aspects of sustainability. Um, Governments can also use, or, or stakeholders can also use the different interventions related to institutions and policies to make sure that the different uh, forestry organizations or other stakeholders take into account any social or any human rights or indigenous rights of the use of access to land. Um, that's what I can think about it right now. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question here. Um, yes, no, you do answer the question. I think it's uh, very interesting and also it's looking at the level of interventions. But more than that, do you think it should become as a core requirement of like sustainable supply chain? So we say uh, it needs to respect human rights. If you do not respect human rights, the supply chain is not sustainable. And in particular, I'm thinking of the recognition of customary rights to land and resources. Uh, as you know, there are many land rights conflicts and um, so I think this is a very important area to address. Yes, and if you look at the interventions in the slide here, there's one type of intervention referring to land tenure. And uh, uh, this could take into account that those, part, those, those aspects you're mentioning. Um, Excellent, thank you. So this brings us to an hour and a half. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Benicio. I just wanted to encourage if there were any last questions because we got started about five minutes late. If you could please type them in now, or if not, I'll begin to conclude the question and answer. And Benicio, if you had anything to add to the end of that question or any concluding thoughts, this would be a great time to share then. Um, you send the presentation to everyone, right? Yes, I've sent to everyone that registered for the course uh, link.
links to download it on Dropbox. I, had to cre I created a new link from my Dropbox so it could be downloaded. The actual file size was quite large. Uh, Diego tried to strip out some of the figures but was unsuccessful. What we'll do is we'll try to break it up into a few different parts and then upload those onto the MBSAP forum so folks could register, or sorry, not register, could download them there. Um, I think Benicio has also prepared some supplemental handouts that we'll upload to the MBSAP forum and then we'll send out a link in the next day or so to have you un download them, not unload them there as well. So it's early in the morning here. <laughs> um, so wanted to say thank you all for joining. If you're not a member of an MBSAP forum, I encourage you to go to www.mbsap.net. Uh, the link is in my signature line that you all will have access to through the email I just sent with the link to download the presentation and then also Benicio has been copied on the email I just sent so you can dialogue with him directly with any questions you have. Um, as he's referenced we will in the next month or so be adding a three-part online series self-paced webinars that you can take yourself to learn more about sustainable commodity supply chains and when those are made public um, I'll send everyone that enrolled for this webinar a link with direct access. So with that Benicio I turn it over to you for any concluding thoughts. Uh, thank you very much to, to everyone that was that participated with questions and uh, was hearing uh, the, the webinar. Here's my email uh, for any questions, any want to discuss anything, thoughts about the presentation, feedback is also welcome. Uh, please feel free to send me an email. And thank you very much. Great. Great. Thanks again, everyone. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you joining. Have a great day or evening. So with that, I'll conclude the webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.